Hi, my name is Marty Kelsey. I host a TV show for middle school students here at the National Air and Space Museum. And it is my great honor to introduce our speaker for today, Astro NASA astronaut Kate Rubens. She recently came back from 115 days on board the International Space Station. While she was there, she conducted two spacewalks and with her crew worked on over 275 different science experiments, including she became the first person to sequence DNA from space. Please welcome to the stage NASA astronaut Kate Rubens. Hi, thanks very much. It's great to be here today. It's actually really fun to be uh, in this great exhibit hall and uh, I'm noticing I see a few spacesuits that look pretty familiar around here and some pieces of spaceflight hardware. So I want to tell you a little bit about our expedition to the space station. This is Expedition 48 and 49 to the International Space Station. And we actually have a video for you um, that uh, describes our mission, if we can play the video about Expedition 48 and 49. So uh, we started training for our space station launch about two and a half years uh, before we actually launched. And uh, when we get ready to launch, uh, we actually do so from Baikonur, Kazakhstan. And so the morning of the launch, you wake up really early, uh, incredibly early. You get into your spacesuit, which is something that we've done a lot before. So we do this kind of uh, getting into our spacesuit in the sim all the time. <laughs> Except for this time, we're actually doing it for real. So we go through a series of pressure checks. We look for leaks in the spacesuit. This is our survival gear uh, if we have a deep press event in the capsule. So we make sure it's all leak checked. We report to the Russian Commission. And then we climb the stairs uh, to actually get on the capsule and go uh, into our rocket. So we actually sit on the rocket launch pad for about four hours uh, before we blast off into space. And this is a feeling like we've never had. We've done this in the sim a lot, but it's nothing like having the rocket uh, light up beneath you. So after about two days, we docked to the International Space Station and opened the hatch for the first time. This was incredible because uh, this was the first time that we've really seen the inside of the space station. Uh, so this is a, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of hardware. Uh, it's amazing how large it is. It's the size of a football field. The inside volume is about the size of a 747. And so we get into the space station and we, we get a chance to see, we were a crew of three in the Soyuz, and we got a chance to see our three crewmates who'd been up there in space already and this was a really fun moment for us we we missed these guys when they left uh, for launch and so to get an, uh, an opportunity to work with them one of the first things that we did was actually do a free flyer capture of the Dragon SpaceX vehicle and so this is a vehicle uh, that launches it comes up to the space station it's carrying cargo and experimental supplies and we use the space station robotic arm to actually capture that vehicle uh, this is really exciting for us because it's got something called the International Docking Adapter uh, on the vehicle. And so that meant that we got a chance to do a spacewalk. So we prepped our suits. We take about 100 hours to prepare our suits. And the day of the spacewalk, we get into our cooling garments. And then we get into our spacesuits. These are different spacesuits now than the ones we launch in. These are the spacesuits that are going to go outside into the vacuum of space. Uh, so we get in our spacesuits and our crewmates get all of our tools and our equipment on us and then they put us into the airlock. We close the hatches and we start the depress. So we have we, all the air molecules from the airlock go outside. Uh, we get down to absolute vacuum and then we can open the hatch and actually go outside into the vacuum of space. Uh, we're outside the space station at this point. So this is, a, this is a really tough thing to do. This is probably one of the hardest parts of space flight. We're working with our tools all the time and, and equipment, uh, and we have to stay mindful of every detail that we're doing. We're, we're working with hardware that's incredibly expensive. It costs more money than you could ever make in your lifetime, so you don't want to give it a stray kick or put it in the wrong place. Uh, but we worked together, and my crewmate and I installed the International Docking Adapter onto the front of Space Station. And what this is going to allow us to do is actually dock U.S. commercial vehicles, vehicles that are launched uh, from the United States are going to dock to the front of Space Station through this adapter. So we were pretty excited to get that job done. We came back in and Mission Control said, congratulations, you can do another spacewalk. So the second spacewalk was really to retract this large radiator. Uh, we didn't want this, this radiator wasn't in use and we didn't want this hanging out and potentially uh, being hit by micrometeoroid debris. So there's a lot of space junk, there's space debris out there and we didn't want that to, to impact the radiator. 
Another thing that we did on this spacewalk was actually use the robotic arm, this time instead of to capture a vehicle, to use a, the robotic arm to fly a person over to a camera port and install some new high definition cameras on board the space station. Once we were done with our spacewalks, we actually had a little bit of time uh, to relax and breathe. It was a really high ops tempo. And one of the things that we really enjoy doing in our free time is actually looking at the cupola, looking at Earth. And so you can see what a beautiful vista this is, being able to see the planet. And so this isn't just something that we do to relax and enjoy. We actually take a lot of photos of the Earth. So we can observe things like glaciers over time. Uh, we can look at entire continents. We can see dust storms. Uh, this is the entire Central Valley of California. You can see the fog moving in the coast. We can see things like weather patterns and geological changes over time. And we can actually also use uh, these, this type of experiment platform to document things like hurricanes and uh, large da disasters. So we, we have something called the International Disaster Charter, which activates all of our space assets. And so when something like Hurricane Matthew came through, we were able to take photos of this from space and actually help in the relief efforts because we can take photos of, of where there's flooding or where bridges have washed out. Uh, so in addition to the space weather patterns, we actually use this uh, to look at educational questions. So schools will send in things that they want uh, pictures taken of, as well as scientific questions. What's going on uh, with geology, with craters, with uh, uh, various formations on the planet? One of the other things that we spent a lot of time on during this expedition was scientific experiments. So one of the first experiments that I worked on was the heart cells experiment. And this was a, a, a dish that where uh, heart cells were grown and they were sent on board the space station. We actually cultured these cells for 30 days and we took a look at how they organize and how they beat. So they actually do beat in space and we're trying to understand cardiovascular effects of space flight. Another thing that we did was the first DNA sequencing in space. And so this is a really small instrument. You can see it's about half the size of your cell phone. Uh, we had a library preparation of DNA that we sent up to space. And we then injected that into the sequencer. And you can see this is the very first DNA sequence from space coming through. Uh, so we could use electrical signal to detect the bases of DNA. And we actually sequenced over 2 billion base pairs of DNA uh, during my time on orbit. Another thing that uh, was really interesting uh, to my crewmate and I was the ability to use some low-tech solutions in space. So uh, this was an experiment to do PCR, and we were looking at how you add things to tubes, but one of the things we needed to do was spin these tubes down. Normally, we'd use a centrifuge, a big complicated piece of equipment on Earth. Uh, here, we didn't have that, so we 3D printed a rotor and used a drill to actually spin these samples down. And so uh, there's an amazing amount of sort of MacGyver type lab work that you can do in these remote environments. Another thing that I was really interested in looking at was how we can do pipetting in space. So this is a standard technique that a lot of people in the lab use. Um, this is how they'll do uh, any kind of molecular biology assay. But our question was, you know, we know that fluids float in space. So what happens when you have fluids attached to a plastic surface? Are they going to float away? Or are they going to stay in that surface? And so we started out with a plate, a 384 well plate. So it's got very small wells. It's pretty likely to keep that fluid captured. But we also tried things like a 96 well plate and a six well plate. So as the wells get bigger, uh, my question was, when does the fluid start to escape? And the answer is we can actually use surface tension, even though the plate's floating, even though you let it go and you catch it again, you can keep that fluid in the plate uh, and, and you can do the normal types of experiments that you would do on Earth just with our standard hardware in space. Another one of the experiments that we really liked was assembling something that we wanted to expose to the vacuum of space. So we could put together an experiment and put it into the Japanese airlock. We could depress the airlock, similarly to how we did with humans, and actually send that experiment out into space robotically. Uh, we then used the Japanese arm to grapple that experiment. We could even do things like put a satellite launcher there and launch miniature satellites from the space station. And so this is an incredible sight to see these satellites tumbling towards the Earth. We're launching them into their own orbit from the space station. 
We also did a lot of experiments on combustion. So this is the combustion chamber here. And what we can do in this experiment is actually have a little fluid chamber and have an igniter. And when it's all closed up in the combustion chamber, we can actually uh, make a flame and see how that burns differently in space. So we don't have gravity. We don't have the same kinds of air convection patterns. Uh, we also were using things like these small satellites here to examine the motion of fluids in space at a larger level. So if you have a big tank and you want to see what would happen, for example, when you launch a rocket, what would happen to the fluid in, uh, in the, those rocket tanks when it reaches microgravity? And so some of these questions we can simulate by having something like a 20 liter tank and have about four liters of fluids in that tank. And then we actually put motion into that tank and we see how the fluid collects in the ends, uh, what it does in terms of transfer and motion back and forth. Uh, and all of the kinds of questions that we need to answer about what happens uh, in a rocket tank when it's no longer under the propulsive force of the rocket when it reaches zero gravity. And this helps our rocket uh, engine designers design uh, better tanks and uh, safer vehicles. So after a few months, we actually got three new crewmates on board. Uh, this was very exciting. This was a great time. We got a chance to capture yet another vehicle. So this is the orbital. Uh, vehicle and this is a huge vehicle. This came up, this was the size of an entire other module docking to space station. And this vehicle brought with it 5,000 pounds of cargo and supplies. And so this was a whole lot more scientific experiments. These are also things like our clothes and our food. We were pretty excited to get this vehicle. We started looking for the food right away. Uh, but it's uh, about 5,000 pounds to unpack. So it's quite a vacation suitcase to unpack. So we had a great time uh, doing all of that, but eventually it t comes time for the mission to end. We needed to make room for a new crew. So we got in our Soyuz spacecraft and we undocked from the space station. Uh, we undock and it's actually a pretty quick trip home. We do a couple orbits around the planet and we then burn our, our, our engine and we do a deorbit burn. And what this does is it sends you through the Earth's atmosphere for about 33 minutes until we land in Kazakhstan. And what we have to do is slow down from 17,500 miles an hour to zero in just that short amount of time. So you can imagine the amount of energy you need to burn off. And we do this by traveling through the atmosphere in what is essentially a giant fireball. So we turn that speed energy into heat energy. We burn off the heat shield and we go through the atmosphere until we can open our parachutes. So we have this nice ride down and uh, everything looks calm and beautiful. But what a, what's about to happen next is a giant impact with the Earth. So we still have a fair amount of speed under those parachutes. And we have some retro rockets that we can fire to cushion the blow a little bit. But we essentially uh, hit the Earth in an Earth accident. And the capsule rolls around for a little while. We cut the parachutes off and we come to a standstill. Uh, this was incredibly exciting uh, because you know that you've landed back on your home planet. And, and the, the, uh, the ride in has been a wild ride, but it's very nice to be still and to see dirt, uh, to open up the capsule and to breathe air for the first time, and to look around and to see the first human beings besides your crewmate that you've seen in months. Uh, so these were the Russian SAR forces that rescued us. It was great to be back on the planet with them. And it's really a wonderful feeling of accomplishment have gone through and done this number of scientific investigations in this mission. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions about what it's like to travel in space, any of our experiments, or simple or mundane things that you might want to ask about spaceflight. And we've got a microphone right here that folks can come up to and ask questions. Yeah, great question. So for scientific testing, do we have anything that stim simulates gravity so that we can compare the changes? And you're absolutely right. We always need a control sample so that we can compare. So we can do this a couple ways. We can either have the same sample that's done at an identical time or with a slight time lag back on Earth. And this is what we do sometimes. We take the same sample, we perform the experiment on Earth, and we perform it on board. We can also use a centrifuge to simulate gravity. So we can simulate either Earth's gravity or partial gravity. We can do uh, Mars gravity or lunar gravity. Uh, for things like uh, plants, we can do this for cell culture. Uh, small samples we can put in the centrifuge and actually run them in parallel on board. Great question, thank you. Sure.
Yeah, so what's it like when you land and you take your first step back on Earth? And you actually feel quite different for the first few weeks of steps back on Earth. So um, what, when you go into microgravity, it's sort of like being on a ship. You know, you get, you get this disorientation of what your brain thinks you're doing and the motion that you feel. And uh, so when you come back to Earth, you have that same problem where you're not used to being in a 1G environment. It actually takes a couple weeks for your body to adapt uh, and relearn how to walk and get all that proprioception back. Thank you. So what happens when you let air go in space? Would it go away or, or what would happen to that air? So if you're in an enclosed vessel like the space station, we can add air to that from a tank and it just adds to the air molecules in space. So we do that, for example, to, su su um, to support our breathing atmosphere in space. But if you're outside in the vacuum of space, and you let those air molecules go, they're just gonna float away. They don't have any other air molecules. They don't have any kind of containment around them. So if you let them go in vacuum, they would just float farther and farther away. So you have to have something to contain all of those air molecules, and that's what the space station is. Oh, uh, okay. Where do you sleep? So we sleep, we have little crew quarters. Um, so they're about the size of a telephone booth, maybe a little smaller. And we can put a sleeping bag, we actually tack it up to the wall, and we sleep on the wall. And that sleeping bag keeps us from floating away. So we can go into our crew quarters, it's a tiny little bunk. It's sort of like being in a fort. And close the door and get in our sleeping bag. Oh. All right, Kate, while, uh, while we get another question up yeah, there, I've got a couple thanks. of questions for yeah, you as thanks. well. Um, you've got a really big background in science. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of how you ended up becoming an astronaut and what you did before you were an astronaut? Yeah, absolutely. So I used to be a scientist. I ran a research laboratory, and we were interested at looking at viruses and the immune system. Uh, so I went to grad school, and I was a research professor. Um, I had a, a field research lab actually in Central Africa, and my main lab was at MIT at the Whitehead Institute. And uh, I found out through the, uh, the government jobs, uh, USA jobs, that there were astronaut applications. And so I submitted a job application to be an astronaut. That's how I, that's how I got into this NASA career. Um, but it's actually, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you don't go too far away from research because of the number of experiments that we're doing on space stations. So essentially, I've stayed as a researcher. I just do a little bit of astronaut training on the side. And, and with that, you're, you're not just trained as a scientist or a pilot, you're, you're really trained kind of across the board, right? Yeah, absolutely. So when we come in for astronaut training, uh, we train to fly in a T-38. We learn how to be pilots if we haven't flown before. And that's because that, kind of, that pilot experience, that aviation experience is actually really good at teaching you how to perform in a high pressure environment. So we also learn how to do spacewalking. We've got to learn how to fly that robotic arm. You don't, you don't wake up in the morning knowing how to control a robotic arm uh, in six dimensions. So we get, we get trained on that. And then we also get trained on all the different science experiments that we're going to do on board. All right, I think we've got another audience question. Yeah. Just a couple of questions. Um, I assume that 100% of the time that you're outside the spacecraft, you're tethered? Is yes, we are always tethered. So we have a really long uh, safety tether. That's your, you, you never want to use that, right? That's your, your backup just in case. Um, that's a, that's a long, it's about a 75 foot safety tether. We also have a, a local tether that's just a, a few foot tether. So when we're translating along, we're using our hands to hold on. And then when we stop to do anything, we put our local tether down. Uh, we also have a couple other ways to stabilize ourselves. We've kind of got a, this more solid restraint and a few other things to grab grab onto. Uh, and at one point, I think I had every single tether that we had attached to space station. Okay. The ground called up and said, uh, do you realize you have all of your tethers on? And I said, yes, I just really want to make sure that I stay stuck on the side of the spacecraft. Thank you. I mean, it, if somehow if you got disconnected, could you guide a craft to get somebody floating around? Yeah, so we do think about that and train for that. Um, we're wearing uh, that we're wearing a jet pack, and there's no other way to describe it. We, are, we do put a jet pack on us before we go out the door, and that has a little bit of nitrogen gas and a hand controller. So if something were to go really wrong and we were to break all of our different tethers, 
uh, and float away, we could actually use that jetpack to navigate back to the space station and to rescue ourselves. Thanks. And then last, was just curious about how you got to go on you know, the, to the space station, is there like a waiting list? And now that you've gone once, do you get to go again? Or how yeah, so there, there's a waiting list. It's called the Astronaut Corps. <laughs> and uh, so we're all, uh, there's, a, there's a group of active astronauts. And so uh, we make sure that everybody is trained and ready to go. And you wait for a mission assignment. So uh, sometimes they need somebody that's got a certain spacewalk capability. Uh, sometimes they need uh, somebody that's got a, a particular type of experience. But in general, we're all trained to do anything. And so we can be assigned a mission whenever they need it, whenever they need somebody to go uh, serve as a member of a crew. Did you ever feel like you were falling when you were outside the spacecraft? Yeah, so that's actually, that's been a common experience. A lot of astronauts have reported that sensation of falling. My commander told me about it. He wanted to prepare me because I'd never been outside before. And so I actually did my own experiment to try to prepare for that. So the, the cupola windows that you saw, I thought, well, maybe if I float feet down towards that, towards the earth, I can provoke that sensation of falling and I can see what that's going to feel like. So I spent a few weekends kind of floating and then climbing out again and then floating again until one of my crewmates caught me doing this and said, he said, Kate, what, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to provoke this sensation of falling, but I couldn't, I couldn't feel it. I never had that. So I don't know if it was a practice I did beforehand, but I never had that outside. I always felt like uh, I don't want to let go of the spacecraft, but I, I didn't really feel like I was falling very much. Awesome. All right, we've got another audience question. Um, is there a way to keep things sitting on like the table in the spacecraft? Yeah, so that's a good question. Here we've got, you know, things on a desk or on your school bench or something like that. On board, if you put something down, it's just going to float away right away. So what we actually do is we stick Velcro to everything. And when you want to keep something from floating away, you take that Velcro on the, that object and you stick it to the wall. But it means that you have to remember everything that you've touched and you've got to keep track of where you put it. So actually, a big part of being in space is losing things and then looking around for them. And it's like you're constantly losing your car keys until you develop that skill of thinking about, OK, I have this thing, and I've stuck it on this wall, and I need to remember where it is again. I think my favorite thing when I see um, downlinks from the International Space Station is when the astronaut will be talking, and they'll just let go of the microphone, and it stays right there. It just floats. How long did that take you to get past on when you started doing presentations when you got back to Earth? So it actually, because everything that, that you're working with, you know, you learn to, to let go. And you learn about how long you can let it go safely and take your attention elsewhere and get back to it and still have it be there. Because if you do that for too long, it wanders away. So uh, you can lose things really quickly. And then there, good luck finding it. There's this common, if, you, if you're watching a space station downlink, an astronaut will float into the module and sort of do this. It means they've just lost something and they're looking for it. And you're looking all around to see where it might have gone. Awesome. We've got another audience question. OK, I have two questions. The first one is, um, you planned and prepared, before you went on to this uh, space station, you planned a ton of things to prepare yourself. Was there something unexpected or unplanned that you've experienced? I know you probably expected a lot of things unplanned, but maybe one significant thing that was not planned that you prepared for. Yeah, so um, I had really prepared sort of for uh, all the work that we were going to do, the tasks that we were going to carry out. What I hadn't really thought about or planned for was what the Earth was going to look like. So I've seen photos and I've seen videos, but I was really taken by surprise what the, the planet looks like when you are orbiting it. And it's, it, to me, it was much brighter. It was glowing. It was like this really b bright blue marble. And I, was, I, was, I hadn't sort of mentally prepared for what the Earth is going to look like. I don't think you can uh, actually do the mental preparation until you see that. So it was, it was a pretty big surprise when I saw that for the first time. Thank you. The other question I have is, um, my husband and I, we geocache a lot, and we heard that there's one geocache in the space station. A geocache? I wish I'd known that when I was up there. I would have <laughs> gone looking for it. That's great. Yes. Uh, there's probably a few geocaches of things that I let go of and never ended up finding on board the space <laughs> station as well. Okay, I will tell you, you that we have a geocache from the National Air and Space Museum. So after you're done with this, don't let any muggles see you, but you can go outside and actually look for that. So, All right, we've got another audience question here. I was wondering if, like, when you do the experiments up in space, and then you do it at the space station, I was wondering if you compare the two? Yeah, so when we do an experiment, we always want to look at a control. 
So we want to do kind of the identical experiment and see what's changing. Because you want to just change one thing in science and you want to keep all the other variables the same. So for example, during the DNA sequencing, we had our sample and we sent half of it to space and we kept the other half on the ground. And then we compared those identical samples between space and ground so that the only difference was that half of them had flown in space. Great question. Thank you. Was it ever frustrating to, because I assume that on, on station you do a lot of science, but you may never see those results. Oh, I saw the results because I was emailing the PIs. <laughs> well, yeah, I was very interested in the results. Uh, so some of the results take a little while. They've got to put together a paper and, and publish that. Um, but the results end up coming out in the scientific literature. And so you can actually look up a lot of the space station results. Are you still following along on those results? All of them. <laughs> Other than the sequencing of DNA, did you have a favorite experiment that you worked on? Um, so I actually, the, the other experiment that we used to look at uh, DNA was called PCR, so polymerase chain reaction. And that's something where you can actually amplify DNA. So uh, you do an exponential reaction. You take one piece of DNA, you copy that, and then you copy it again, so you make four pieces of DNA, then you make eight, and, and you keep going on until you have enough DNA to detect by some method. And so we actually had a couple different kinds of PCR instruments on board. Um, what we can do with those is you can put a fluorescent tag into the DNA, and while you're doing this copying reaction, you can read that fluorescent tag with a laser. And so you can tell how much DNA you've got of a particular type of sample. So I was really excited to do quantitative real-time fluorescent PCR, which is a mouthful, but you guys can take that back and throw that into one of your science reports and, and get an A-plus on that. Um, that was pretty exciting to actually see that happen in microgravity as well. That's cool. Don't forget, if you've got a question, come up to the microphone. Uh, we'll be taking your questions here. Um, so you talked about your um, educational background a little bit. What kind of student were you when you were in middle school? Uh, so I was a, a pretty nerdy student, I have to say. I was not one of the popular kids. Um, but I, I really liked uh, science at that point. Um, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, when I was a high school student, I actually started doing um, some public health outreach. So we worked with other kids to learn about viruses um, and to do some public health prevention work. And that's what got me really interested in viruses. So I knew that I was interested in DNA. Um, I'd actually gone to a conference on recombinant DNA at the Exploratorium. So similar museum as this. And I thought it was fascinating uh, when I was around 15 to think about things like DNA molecules, how you can uh, change DNA, how that might have an impact on human health and disease. And viruses are fascinating little creatures, aren't they, right? They're little bits of DNA and they're packaged in a membrane and sometimes they make us sick. Uh, sometimes they're not pathogenic. Uh, things like bacteria, we need the bacteria actually. So all of these are little bits of DNA uh, and they interact with humans in some way. And I just always thought that was incredibly fascinating. So you're a NASA astronaut and I, I want to know, because I taught middle school for a long time, have you ever experienced failure? Oh, all the time. <laughs> if you're a scientist, you're, you get a little bit more used to failure than success. So uh, most experiments will often fail the first time you set them up. And that's one of the interesting things about science is that you design an experiment to ask a question but you don't know what the answer is gonna be. And so nine times out of 10, that experiment doesn't work the first time. So then you tweak one of those variables. So we had a great question about controls uh, earlier, and you, you keep all of the variables the same except for you change one variable. And so a lot of science is about failing, but that's how you discover things. So you fail at an experiment, you try it again. Sometimes when you fail, you learn something fantastic about that experiment. So it seems like those things that I used to teach in middle school science follow through all the way to the International Space absolutely, Station. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, it's really much more about uh, a quest for discovery than a guaranteed success. So if there's something that you wonder, you know, how does this work, then, then you're a scientist just by asking that question. What's the training like for a spacewalk? So it's a, it's a lot of training. We do about 300 hours of training in the neutral buoyancy laboratory. So it's, uh, it's one of the biggest pools you've ever seen. We actually have a mock-up of the space station submerged entirely underwater. And we get in our spacesuits. The spacesuits are 
are airtight and watertight, so we can actually go underwater in the spacesuits. And this is the best simulation that we have of microgravity. So uh, we still have the water drag, but we can get weighed out to be neutrally buoyant. So you can move around in all six axes. And uh, we can practice installing the hardware, even just things like how you move yourself around in this 400-pound spacesuit. Take quite a few hours to learn. Um, how important is the ground team that supports you? You kind of get all the, all the press and all the glitz and glamour, but you've got a large ground team supporting you as well. Absolutely, and I would say they're, they're far more important than I am. Um, you know, we're, we're the ones uh, at the end of the day that get a chance to fly and to do these kinds of things, but everything on the space station is controlled by the ground team. It was built by the ground team, and so there's thousands of uh, engineers, rocket scientists, uh, folks that are building our life support system, people that are designing the experiments that fly to space. And so that's really, it's an international effort. Uh, and there's thousands and thousands of people that work at NASA that are doing things like thinking about how do we design the DNA sequencer that's going to go up to space. So it's really a joy for me when I get to work with those folks uh, that are thinking about space and solving these hard problems day in and day out. What experiment would you like to see up in space next? Oh, I've got like a list of five of them. But um, my, uh, my, uh, my favorite experiment, the one that I've been thinking about a lot that I'm really excited about right now, um, that they're actually, they just launched about a week ago, um, is an experiment to look at microbes in space. So we're going to use the DNA sequencer. And this actually has some student involvement. So students are participating in this experiment. Um, we'd like to look at the microbiome of the space station. So you have millions of microbes that are living in you and on you, and most of these are harmless. Uh, a lot of them are good bacteria, but every surface that we touch is coated with microbes. You guys are all going to wash your hands after this, right? Um, it's, there's, a, there's a microbiome of every environment that we're in. I'm curious about what the microbiome is of the spacecraft. We've had this, this spacecraft, it's been separate from the planet for 16 years. Uh, we have all these microbes up there, and we don't really know what they are. We know that they're probably not too harmful to humans, uh, and they're all initially planetary in origin. But my question is, who is there? Like, who stays in the spacecraft? How do they change? Uh, what happens when you get a new astronaut uh, onto the space station? Does that change the whole population of microbes up there? And so we can look at that with the sequencer. That's one of the things we're working on now. It seems like that may be really important for a future trip to Mars. Absolutely. Understanding uh, what happens to the, the human microbiome as well as the spacecraft microbiome. If you're going to launch something from Earth and let it go for years, you want to know what that's like and how it's changing. All right, we've got another audience question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my question kind of relates to your question. But um, how do you see the future of space, say in the next 30 years, 50 years, what do you see happening? Yeah, so NASA's actually got a, a that we've been thinking about this a lot, and uh, we have a lot of plans for what we're going to do for exploration. And so um, I think everybody's thinking about Mars, you know, Mars is the goal, but there's a lot of steps that we got to do in order to get there. And so one of the things that we're doing is actually using the International Space Station to figure out what kinds of questions do we need to answer about human health before we get to Mars. We've got to think about radiation effects on humans. We have to think about uh, how, how we provide nutrition. Um, things like bone loss, we have some eye problems in astronauts. So we're going to be answering a lot of those questions in the next uh, few years on space station. But then we're also working on building spacecraft that are capable to go to Mars. So we need to do some kind of check out of these spacecraft, potentially in lunar orbit. Uh, where we do some long duration missions that aren't too far yet from the planet. And then we build up to the ability to send a spacecraft with humans in it to Mars. Uh, and that's going to be around the mid 2030s. So there's some really concrete plans out there, actually, of how we're going to get to Mars. Where we go beyond, um, you know, that's, that's anybody's guess. I think as we start to develop the capability to explore, we're going to want to go further and further into the solar system. Uh, but I think really pushing past low Earth orbit is what we're looking at for exploration now. Thank you. Are you ready to go to Mars? Um, yeah, it's going to be a long trip, <laughs> so I want to I want to sample all the microbes first and make sure the spacecraft is good. But yeah, I think it would be you know it's going to be an incredible challenge. It it may not be people of my generation going to Mars. You know, it may be uh, some folks. Uh, I see a lot of people in the audience that are that are junior high, high school age. You guys might be about the right age to go to Mars. So astronaut applications are online. I will tell you, you got to look for that every four or five years uh, and and think about if you want to join us for a Mars exploration. 
Speaking of young students, we've got one with a question. How does the food taste? How does the food taste? That's a good question. So you have to make sure that the food can survive space. So a lot of times we send freeze-dried food. But you can actually rehydrate that, and it tastes pretty good. Uh, so my favorite thing up there, I liked M&Ms a lot. Those are, those are fun to eat in space, right, because you can toss them, and then you go fly, and you go catch them. It's playing with food at the dinner table. Your parents would hate it. Um, but there's, you know, our parents aren't on the space station, so we, we kind of do whatever we want with M&Ms up there. Um, but all of the food is really good. So we have things like chicken, green beans, uh, pudding, uh, anything you can think of. Uh, they'll send up a standard menu, and it tastes pretty good. How much fun is, is just a ball of water? Uh, delightful for hours. <laughs> so it's uh, I actually brought up some, you got to be a little careful when you put food coloring in it, right? Because you can't stain the walls of the space station. But if you put food coloring in the water, you can actually see how the different types of water mix. Um, you can, you know, you can play with larger uh, balls of water and, and uh, see how they're, they're really interesting thing is like if you put a ball of water on your hand, it'll actually stick to your hand. It, it, the surface tension is really what dominates. And so just kind of watching water as it, may, it gets a little creepy sometimes, it's a little horror movie when you, when you watch it because you don't expect that kind of behavior, but it's fascinating. And students can take an eyedropper and a penny and count how many drops of water you can put on top of a penny and you will be absolutely amazed at how many drops you can get on a penny. We've got another audience question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, was it really cold in space? And my second question is, um, what was the most like, uncomfortable thing you experienced? Yeah, so was it cold in space when we're outside on the spacewalks? Um, it varies between minus 200 degrees and plus 200 degrees. So yeah, extremely cold outside, particularly when it's, when it's dark and when you're in shadow. Um, we are in the spacesuits and we have a thermal system to keep us insulated. So we can actually regulate our temperature. Um, I did find after about four hours in the spacewalk, my feet got really cold. You, can't, you just can't warm them up. And so uh, you're kind of floating in space and I was trying to do things like kick my boots together and, and stomp my feet to warm them up. Uh, inside, we have a thermal uh, life support system that actually controls the temperature. So the temperature is whatever the commander sets it to. Um, so it can get a little cold if your commander likes it colder, uh, but it's pretty pleasant inside. Does space have a smell? It does, yeah. And so, and the, and the only way you're going to smell it is if you're exposed to the vacuum of space. So when we docked uh, the, the SpaceX vehicle, we actually docked that to the space station and the hatch is depressurized uh, to dock it initially. And we repress that hatch and we open it up. But as soon as you open it up, you get that, you get a smell of space, right? It's just been in the vacuum of space. And so, uh, you know, we all kind of crowded around and made sure we could try to, we could try to smell space. And it smells, it's a little bit like a burning odor. It smells a little bit like ozone, uh, was my impression of it. All right, we got one more question here. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. My first question is, are the spacesuits hot? And my second question is, are they comfy? Um, so are the spacesuits hot and are they comfy? So you actually wear a cooling garment, uh, which is a whole bunch of little tubes that surround you, and, and you can flow cold water through the tubes, and that tel helps keep the heat away from the body. And you're absolutely right that if you don't have that kind of cooling, so you know, I said my feet get cold, but you can also get too hot as well. And so we can control the body temperature by regulating this water. Um, and they are definitely not comfortable. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's like being uh, sort of inside a basketball. You're at about 4.2 PSI. Um, it's, a, it's a 300, 400 pound spacesuit. So it is very uncomfortable to move around in. Uh, you just get used to that kind of thing. Kate, thank you so much. I think we've got something coming up here. Yes, absolutely. So this is from the crew of Expedition 49, and we wanted to thank the Smithsonian for hosting us here. So this is our crew photograph. This is our whole crew here, uh, and this is a picture out on one of the spacewalks. And uh, this was a picture I took, actually, of the moon at nighttime over the planet. Wow, thank you so much. And let's give Kate a big round of applause. Thank you, guys. All right, that wraps up our presentation. Thank you so much for watching.